If you are interested in quantum physics, you have probably heard the concept of a particle being in two places at once. That's only kinda true, and I want to offer a more accurate explanation. To do so, we're going to define the notion of a vector and see how it applies to quantum physics. A vector, as commonly taught in physics, is something that has both magnitude and direction. As an example, take velocity. You could be traveling at 30 km per hour, the magnitude, and be doing so eastwards, the direction. The most common way of visually representing a vector is as an arrow. This works quite well, since arrows have both magnitude, the length of the arrow, as well as direction. These arrows could be drawn anywhere, but it is very common to draw these arrows as stemming from the same location, known as the origin. But this is only one part of the definition of a vector. The second part is how different vectors relate to one another. Specifically, let's now look at how addition of vectors is defined where the goal is to add two vectors to get a new vector. If the vectors have the same direction, then this is actually pretty straightforward. One can put the two vectors one after the other, and the resulting vector will go from the base of the first one to the tip of the second one. This is actually how addition of regular numbers works on the number line. But what if the two vectors we are adding do not have the same direction? Well, what we can do is simply use the same scheme. Put one vector up against the other, and the addition of the two vectors will then be the vector whose base is at the base of the first one, and whose tip is at the tip of the second one. And, to be clear, this is just a definition. We could choose to define addition however we want, but it turns out that this specific scheme is very useful for many different applications. We are also going to define what is known as scale and multiplication, where a vector gets multiplied by a regular number. The result of this operation is a vector with the same direction, but whose length has been multiplied by the number in question. But this only makes sense when multiplying by positive numbers, so what happens when we multiply a vector by a negative number? Here, we can once again take inspiration from the number line where we see that multiplying by a negative has the effect of changing its direction to be the opposite direction of what it was before. And indeed, this is how multiplying by a negative is defined for vectors in general. Now this is where it gets kinda interesting. Because when we have just the one vector, we can make new vectors by simply scaling the original one. By choosing different scaling factors, we can notice that all the possible vectors obtained this way can be visualized by a line. This line of possible vectors is what's known as a vector space. But, what if we have a second vector that we add on to the result of scaling the first vector? we get a new line of possibly obtainable vectors, shifted from the first line by the second vector. From here, we can also scale the second vector, which will shift the line around by however much we choose. So by allowing for every possible combination of scaling, we get that the possible obtainable vectors cover the entire plane. The plane, much like the line, is a vector space. The upshot of this process is that given two basis vectors, we can represent any vector in the plane by a linear combination of the two vectors. Linear combination here is a fancy term for scaling each vector and then adding them together. The two vectors are called a basis of the vector space. And this process can be continued. If we introduce a third vector, we can use it to sweep the plane through the third dimension. 3D space requires three basis vectors. In fact, dimension of a vector space is defined by how many vectors are needed to form a basis of the vector space. If we stop thinking about vectors as these drawn arrows, we can actually go even further. To do so, we instead want to think a bit more abstractly, 
if we have a two-dimensional vector space and two basis vectors, we can decide to name these vectors something, for instance vector a and vector b. The linear combinations of vector a and vector b can now be reasoned with purely symbolically without having to draw any arrows. If we add a third basis vector to the mix, then we can reason about three-dimensional vector spaces in the same abstract way. And, since we're no longer constrained by what we can visualize, we can even add more basis vectors onto that, and thus reason about spaces with more than three dimensions. This is important because, while we have so far treated vectors as something to do with physical space, the abstract representation is quite a lot more powerful and has a wide variety of applications in both math and the sciences. Some quantities in physics that are represented by vectors are velocity, acceleration, forces, electric and magnetic fields, degrees of freedom, and of course, quantum physics. To detail what vectors have to do with quantum physics, let me offer an example. Say we have a particle, and we have three boxes that the particle can be in. Classically, what are the possible states of the system? Well, that is rather straightforward. One state is that the particle is in the first box, another state is that it's in the second box, and the third is that it's in the last box. These are the three states that the system can be in. Quantum physically, however, these three classical states act as basis vectors, and the possible states are the vector space formed by the possible linear combinations of these basis vectors. That is to say, a state is some linear combination of the basis states. This is what's being referred to when people say that a particle is in two places at once. Hopefully this gives some clarification as to how that statement is a bit lacking. A linear combination is a very specific way of combining two things that I don't feel is quite captured by the more common description. That's not to say either that this makes quantum physics more intuitive. If you found this confusing, that's okay. I would argue that the only way to become comfortable with quantum physics is to first get comfortable with linear algebra. Linear algebra is the part of math that deals with vectors. I encourage you to learn more about linear algebra on your own if this video intrigues you. If people enjoy this video, I might consider doing a second part where I go deeper into how linear algebra is used in the theoretical study of quantum physics. But regardless, thank you for watching.